Now, before we get going, you probably have questions like, why is he still in the dome? Why is he dressed like that? Is that hairstyle just like advanced bald spot covering? It's just sometimes you can't explain things. Actually, I was recording something for my other class, and I thought it'd be silly, so I'm leaving this on because I want to talk a little bit about hypothesis testing and sampling distributions so uh, and confidence intervals. So I want to get across... Um, Sorry, my this mic doesn't pick up from very far away, so I'm holding it like I'm sort of like, I love you for sentimental reasons. No, uh, I have to hold it like some kind of crooner, and it's too fancy. I should have used another mic, but it's here right now. All right, so let's talk about some of the stuff we know right now. I'm hoping you understand a sampling distribution because and I could explain that again, but there are lots of places I've explained that. Other people have explained it. So let's say you've got, um, you know, a sample. You've got a sample of observations and, you know, they're blah, 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 blah. And you find the mean, the sample mean right there. And then you think to yourself, okay, but where's the population mean? Well, the sample mean is your point estimate of the population mean. This is your point estimate of the population mean. Every value from a sample is your estimate of that same value from the population. So you've, well, there are some exceptions, but sometimes you have to tweak it, but not the sample mean. The sample mean is our best estimate of the population sample mean. So we think to ourselves, all right, is this the sample mean? Almost certainly not, but, and we can't find out what the sample mean is, but at least we can ask ourselves, how precise is our estimate? And that's what a confidence interval is for. Like how, how much can we trust this sample uh, mean going on here? Okay, these things are stacked like crazy. I'm going to use purple because it looks kind of dark. So how much can I trust these things? Oops, drop that one. Pink. So you calculate a confidence interval. And I mean, in the end, at the end of the day, you can just use the formula and the confidence interval is always, let's see, yeah, let's, this will all work. A confidence interval is always an estimate. So in this case, the mean is an estimate of the population mean. It's an estimate, plus and minus, um, some kind of a Z-ish thing. Sometimes we'll use T, which is a lot like Z, times the standard error, right? Now, right now, it's the standard error of the mean, and right now we're using a Z, which is an actual Z-score, and right now the estimate is the mean itself. So it's the mean plus or minus a Z, which is usually 1.96, but it could be 1.65 or 2.58, and then times the standard error of the mean, which is always the standard deviation of the raw scores in the population that you think, divided by the square root of n. Now, the first thing I'm going to tell you is that we never know the standard deviation in the population, so we actually use this thing called T, which is a lot like Z. The numbers will be very similar. So um, for a 95% confidence interval, the, the Z score is always 1.96. Well, for the T, if you have a really big sample size, like a couple hundred, then it'll also be 1.96, but it depends on your sample size. So for a T, um, you'll look it up in a table. It might be like 2.03 or 2.19 or something like that. Anyway, it's the same idea, same kind of thing, T. And then we don't know the population standard deviation, but we know the sample standard deviation. There we go. That's it. All right, so we've got our sample mean, which is an estimate of the population mean, and we do this calculation and we get a number here and a number here. There we go, that's our confidence interval. This number and this number, confidence interval, right? Now in the meantime, to get there, we you could just do the math, but it comes from this complicated thing that I'm hoping that you'll understand at least a little bit, which is we imagine ourselves a distribution of all kinds of means, millions and millions of means, just like our mean that came from the same population. And how would they be distributed? They would be distributed in the sampling distribution of means, and the standard deviation would be the standard error of the mean, which is kind of like the standard deviation of the original distribution, but it's smaller because you divide it by square root of n. Anyway, you come up with a sampling distribution of means. Everything in here is a mean. Millions and millions of means, right? 
sampling distribution of means. Once you have that sampling distribution, it's just a problem of looking up in the table and finding out what score cuts off like 2.5% there, and what score cuts off 2.5% on the top side. And whatever those scores are, that's your confidence interval. And you can say, I'm 95% confident that the true population mean lies between these two things. Or you can do the really long version, which is if we were to repeat this uh, experiment or this study over and over again with the same population and randomly sample over and over again, then 95% of the time, the true population mean mu would be between whatever confidence interval limits we found for each of those things. So that's the long version. The short version is I'm 95% confident. So we're 95% confident that this is where the true population mean lies. Okay, now this is the formula. This is the format. We're going to we're going to always be coming up with a sampling distribution of the thing that is estimating something in our population. So if, we're, if we want to know about the population mean using the sample mean, then we need to use a sampling distribution of sample means, of all possible sample means with some assumptions, like if the true mean was this and stuff like that. So um, that's always the formula. Now, we often have a hypothesis value, a special one, the null hypothesis. We often have the null hypothesis, which is like, it's always some version of nothing to see here, etc. So for instance, uh, if this was, I think there's an example in some stuff I wrote for you guys lately. If this was uh, speeds on a highway, and this is the sample mean speed, and you found that on average people went like 58.3 miles per hour or something, a good null hypothesis would be 55. Well, actually, the hypothesis isn't a number. A hypothesis is a statement. So null hypothesis, the true population mean equals 55 miles per hour, right? And so you'd f put your 55 on here, and you can find out if it's plausible. You have a range of plausible values. It's from here to here. With 95% confidence, you can say it is plausible that the true population mean lies between these two values, my lower limit and my upper limit of my confidence interval, my 95% confidence interval. If it was a 99%, we'd say with 99% confidence, etc. So stick with 95. So if 55 falls in here, then it's plausible. Now the null hypothesis is a sad hypothesis. The researchers don't like it. They don't believe, they don't want to believe it. They think they've found something else most of the time. And so it's sad when, the f when, it, when it's in here because it's plausible. The thing that nobody wants to believe, it's plausible. Your cousin is really your sister? You must believe it. It's plausible. Okay, it's not that bad. But your research project isn't, you know, discovering anything interesting, usually, is what this means. So if any value is between these two numbers, then with whatever percent confidence, like 95% confidence, then it is plausible that that could be the true population mean. Because, you know, this is a sample. It came from some population with values that we don't know about and somewhere there's a mean somewhere left or right anywhere there's a mean somewhere that's what we're trying to do we're trying to figure out where that might be so everything here is about samples estimating stuff from populations because we don't have the population if you have the population you don't do any of this you just count things and say that's it we're done you report a sample mean you report some frequencies you're done you don't do any of this fancy stuff we learn in this class well from here on out in this class you just l do the stuff we learned in the first couple of weeks but we never know the population mean and the population values it never actually happens so we're constantly trying to figure out what these population values might be so we can do this with any sample statistic anything we get from a sample you just have to specify the distribution of all possible things of that thing and then we find a middle 95 percent or whatever so what if instead of this situation and now this is going to come up very soon in this class what if what we're really looking at is a difference between two things let's say we look at um critical thinking scores of I don't know, like 50 seniors graduating from Fredonia and 50 seniors gradua graduating from SUNY Oneonta. Is that how you say that? Oneonta? Maybe I should pick one I can pronounce. Anyway, the other SUNY, the SUNY O. So in your sample, you've got this situation, and, and there will be a difference be between the mean critical thinking in your sample. Let's say the SUNY 
Fredonia seniors are just a little bit higher than the Oneonta seniors, right? So, I mean for Fredonia, I mean for Oneonta. So, it, and you know, there's each has a distribution of, of sample values, right? So you want to know how plausible is it that the difference between them is a certain amount. Well, you calculate a confidence interval not for a mean, but for a difference between two means. So instead of imagining uh, what if I did this over and over again and drew from this sample and got all these samples of the same size and calculated a mean from each one and created a distribution of the means, you complicate that and you say what if from the population of all of the Sunni Oneonta and all of the Sunni Fredonia, I sample over and over and over again from each of them and every time I get a sample from here and a sample from here, I subtract from the, like one from the other, always the same way, like let's say Fredonia minus Oneonta, so a positive one means Fredonia is awesome, that's fun. Um, and I kind of up with a difference. So now we're talking about a difference between means. Well, you can, you have to kind of not even use the same scale anymore, because maybe these are critical thinking scores that go from like 0 to 237. I don't know, there's some critical thinking scale that does that. Well, now it's going to be differences. And let's say in your sample you get the differences the difference here is like 13.2 points on this scale, 13.2. So you say, what if that's the true population mean? We always do that with confidence interval. You say, what if what I found in my sample is truly what's going on in the population? Even though we don't think it's true, we, we do that. And I start from there, and now I need a new, I'm just, I can't draw a straight line to save my life. Here, these are raw scores, right? And then each, each value here is a raw score. It's a critical thinking score that some kid got from school. Up here, we're going to have, we're going to label this x bar f minus x bar o because every value here is a difference. I don't know if we can see that very well. Let me draw it. Minus x bar o. Every value on this number line is a difference between Sunni Fredonia and Sunni Oneonta means. So you millions and millions of times you're imagining taking a sample from Fredonia, a sample from Oneonta, always the same n. So like if this n was 50 and this n was like 38, always this n is 50 and this n is 38. So the n's always stay the same, otherwise none of this works. You have to keep the n's the same. So you imagine drawing all these samples, and every time you draw a sample, you take the Oneonta sample, you calculate its mean. You take the Fredonia sample, calculate its mean. Do Fredonia mean minus Oneonta mean. That's why the bar up here, because these are sample means. So this is a distribution of differences between all possible sample means. It's all possible distributions of differences. And so you're th the, the differences could be, you know, like zero, or they could be positive, like if Fredonia is better, or they could be negative only if Oneonta is better. And you're saying, we found 13.2, so maybe that's up here. So we always assume for a confidence interval that that's the true population mean, but it's not a mean of, it's not a mean of means. It's not a mean of raw score values. It's a mean of differences between sample means, a mean of differences between means, millions and millions of differences between means, and then we imagine a, a distribution of those. Okay, that's really crooked, but let's just imagine it. And then you go find, if you want a 95% confidence interval, you go find the place where there's 2.5% of that distribution there and 2.5% of that distribution there. Now this is going to be um, a T-shaped distribution which is very similar to a normal distribution. You just look the values up in a different table. <laughs> For as far as we're concerned, just look them up in a different table, but it's otherwise it's the same. And then you just find this difference between means and this difference between means. Now is zero a plausible difference? I drew it so that yes it is. This is the lower limit of the confidence interval and this is the upper limit and zero is just inside the lower limit. I don't know, maybe we find that this is like, you know, negative uh, 2.1 and this is positive. These numbers aren't going to make sense because I can't do math in my head. This is positive like 17.3, whatever. But zero is inside there. 
Well, then zero is plausible. In this case, all the time, when you have two sample means, you're thinking the null hypothesis is that in the population there is no actual difference between those population means. Therefore, on average, there will also be no difference in the population means. So the null hypothesis says the population mean of Fredonia minus the population mean of Oneonta is zero. So that's the null hypothesis expected value. The null hypothesis value is plausible, so we got to accept the null hypothesis. We can't reject it. We're like, damn, we can't say that Fredonia people are smarter than Oneonta people after all. You could change your criteria to have only a 90% confidence interval, then, and then these things would move in, and maybe the zero would be the outside, and then you could say, aha, with 90% confidence. But yeah, that's how it works. And you can do that with any, any, anything that you can get from a sample. Okay, this is the worst eraser known to mankind, this rag. I erased my board with a rag on a stick. So anything in your sample, maybe you find that I, anything that can be reduced to one number, by the way. In your sample, maybe you find that um, there is a difference between psych majors, psych majors, like, I don't know, what percentage of people are doing good social distancing. Psych majors, it's 83%, and then, uh, yeah, you just go with that. And say, Fredonia psych majors, 83% are doing social distancing. And you say to yourself, well, is that a lot? Is that a little? What's the population proportion? Not means anymore. Now it's a proportion. I mean, the math only works if you turn it into a proportion, so 0.83. Math likes proportions, not percentages in general. It's all been built on proportions. So 0.83, that's the proportion of Fredonia students in your sample that are socially isolating. But you only have a sample, like, I don't know, maybe n is 52 or something, some number. And so you think, you know, what? what's the population proportion of psych students who are socially isolating. So you can do a confidence interval. You can come up with all proportions. Actually, this can only go from 0 to 1, and you have like up here 0 0.83, so it gets a little weird, but that's okay, that's fine. That's your observed proportion, and you think, what if I were to sample over and over and over and over again, and every single time with my new random sample I calculated the proportion? You'll get a proportion. You'll get, you'll get a sampling distribution of proportions. And then you find this and this, and you've got a confidence interval for proportions. And if you have a null hypothesis that says actually only 50% are self-isolating, then you just find out, is the 50% outside there? Well, no, we reject that null hypothesis because it's not in our plausible range of values. Or if 50% is in here, you're like, oh, we got to accept that value. We're going to go with the null hypothesis because it's plausible. You can do that. You can do it for a difference between two proportions. You can have the sampling distribution of the difference between two proportions. Um, for the analysis of variance, which gets really brain twisty, and you can stop listening now if you want and come back to this when we do ANOVA, we want to compare more than two means. So what I showed you with the two means, that's a t-test for two means. But for analysis of variance, you have like group, like, I don't know, maybe you're looking at critical thinking skills of three schools, and Fredonia is here, or uh, Fredonia mean is here, and maybe the distribution is like that, and then right below here is SUNY Oneonta, and their distribution is, you know, overlapping, and then better than all of us is Stony Brook, actually, I don't think so, I think we're better than Stony Brook, but anyway, um, you find that, and you say, well, what, can I be confident that those means are different in the population? Well, you can just treat each of them as an individual value and measure their variance. You just plug them into the variance formula. It's like, I have a data set now and it only has three things. And I have a variance. And so then you imagine to yourself a sampling distribution of the variance of all of these things. Now you don't have to worry about this. The distribution will always have some shape and, and it'll always be possible to find a chunk in the middle of it, a 95% chunk in the middle of it. So the sampling distributions for variances are always horribly right skewed because variance can't be lower than zero. And it can go up to like infinity. And let's say we find that our variance is right here us and it's the variance among those things it's the difference so 
our hypothesis is going to be about like where's the true and our confidence interval is always going to be always going to be about where's the true variance variance is kind of like average differences among things it's like how spread out things are so how spread out are these means well we're always interested in to see whether they're spread out zero so the null hypothesis is always kind of like the variance is zero and you want to show that there's they're not zero you can say there are differences in the population between the critical thinking skills of these three groups we don't know which differences because it's three groups you could have five or eight or whatever it's the same thing we don't know which differences but at least we would have an idea whether there are differences so you put us and you can put a confidence interval here and you can find out whether the variance value of zero is up is it within the confidence interval or not actually it turns out variance of zero isn't quite at that left point but anyway that's a detail it doesn't matter anything you can measure from this from the sample a sim a sample mean frequencies of things um, proportions of things differences between things differences between two samples differences among multiple samples in means and proportions that's a lot of what statistics is we come up with a sampling distribution for all possible of that thing and then we use that sampling distribution to test a null hypothesis and to do a confidence interval. Now the way we test null hypotheses, there's this whole formal thing. The confidence interval version is way easier, but and it gives you the same answer, but we need to learn the, the formal thing as well, which is what we're going to dive into with t-tests. And I think that's where I'm going to stop now, except I'm going to be all like, i love to get you. On a slow boat to China, all to myself, alone. Okay, that's, nobody needs to hear that today.